first thing I'd like to say was that that was a very nice presentation, and uh, I think you'll see I agree with a lot of what you said, and and uh, in the spirit of the debate, uh, we'll try to take it to the other side. Uh, we're, uh, we're talking about uh, APRV, and my position is that it's not really an advance for us and actually should be considered very carefully. It was first described in 1987 by Christine Stock and John Downs. Uh, these are two anesthesiologists who are working mainly with the surgical population. And in recent years, uh, Nader Bashi has uh, taken over uh, as the leader in this area and uh, continue to promote um, awareness and enthusiasm for the mode. I like cartoons and sometimes they fit. Uh, there's always one who has to be a little bit different and that was APRV. At the time it was very innovative. Uh, airway pressure release, uh, as Dr. Lynn has nicely uh, pointed out, is basically uh, spontaneous breaths occurring at mainly the high level of pressure and then periodically the machine drops its pressure and then rebuilds it. It's not the same uh, exactly as bi-level ventilation where a second level of positive end expiratory pressure is um, applied at the lower level and spontaneous breaths continue uh, through both phases. Bi-level ventilation can go into APRV but uh, in many centers, especially in the United States, we go with bi-level ventilation, uh, which is a little more controllable and a little more easy to set peep, for example, and know where you are. Now, the original rationale for APRV uh, was to maintain spontaneous breathing, uh, and the statement is made in the original patient, the paper, most ARDS patients do not need help with ventilation. High mean airway pressure and alveolar pressures uh, means that recruitment will be prioritized mainly for oxygenation, and they only barely mentioned uh, the possibility of ventilator-induced lung injury. And one other thing is that one mode could be used for all stages of acute illness. No need to transition between uh, assist control and pressure support, for example. Now, just a little while after that, a paper was uh, uh, produced. Uh, Burkhard Lachman uh, published a very influential editorial uh, stating, let's open up the lung and keep it open. And people interpreted this to really expand everything you could, everything recruitable. And in the setting of the laboratory or in uh, pediatric uh, circumstances, that made a lot of sense because of the pathologies that were being induced or encountered in those settings. But over the years, APRV has never caught on. Uh, you know, pull out, Betty, pull out, you've hit an artery. Uh, it's not, this is not a, a mode that's applicable to all situations, and it keeps on getting resistance because people interpret it as being something. Uh, I'm sorry for my humor, but you know, this has been going on since 1987. It's like a 30-year engagement to marriage. Something is not quite right with APRV and targeting the fully open lung as we've, uh, we've understood this. What's wrong with prioritizing the fully open lung? Basically, it's higher mean airway pressure. It impedes venous return, promotes uh, the possibility of coropulmonale, increases global lung stress, which, as I'll show you in a minute, is important. Uh, and it is a fairly inefficient way to ventilate if you're not recruiting at high, higher levels of uh, mean airway pressure. Lung expansion may increase vascular stresses. Zone 3 conditions become zone 2 conditions. And under those conditions, dead space and right ventricular afterload rise if there's no compensatory recruitment. So the question is, how recruitable are the patients you're talking about if you want to use AR, uh, APRV? If you put on high pulmonary vascular stresses, you may encounter excessive right ventricular afterload uh, and a tendency to worsen any pre-existing uh, susceptibility for core pulmonale. And in fact, in the literature, there are indica indications that 
Patients who are spontaneously breathing and then stop spontaneously breathing are then elevated with a high level of end, uh, uh, end expiratory pressure and high mean airway pressure, and they drop the bottom out of their blood pressure. Uh, this is not, doesn't happen very often, but when you're operating at high levels of uh, APRV, that can happen. And in fact, I concern myself a lot about that. You have to watch these patients extremely carefully. If they're not contributing to their own ventilation anymore, then you basically have just jumped the uh, mean, effective mean alveolar pressure considerably and face the consequences. We've always wondered whether the lung should be rested or recruited. Uh, Didier A. Dreyfus uh, was one of the first to, to put it into a nice, elegant editorial. Uh, and we learned that with the, uh, the, the oscillate, uh, uh, high-frequency oscillation trial, where you're using very small tidal volumes, very small driving pressures, operating at a high mean airway pressure, and the patients who had uh, the a, a, a high frequency oscillatory ventilation died at a faster rate right from the beginning of the uh, study, possibly implicating cardiovascular consequences. So the operating range that you're in is an important consideration in APRV. When it's high, as it was in the oscillate trial of HFO, then you're running more dangers. Did oscillate HFO sail too close to the danger zones of the fully open lung for vascular reasons? I think they did. Um, over distension was another possibility to increase the global stress uh, upon the lung. Now, how, f how recruitable are you? Uh, Gattinoni's uh, New England Journal of Medicine paper suggested that uh, the, the number of patients who could be recruited uh, at a high level were very small. Uh, in Brazil, they suggested that there was a much uh, broader population and uh, more recruitable patients were who they were dealing with. Uh, if you look at the majority of patients who are not responders, do not recruit very well, then what you see is that the, uh, the uh, arterial blood pressure will fall as you try to recruit the lung. And uh, that, that can have a hemodynamic consequence for the patient, especially if you sustain those high levels of uh, transpulmonary lung pressure. If you respond and recruit, of course, that's a different story. You bring more capillary bed online, and the, um, the, the dangers are much less. So it depends if you're recruiting or not recruiting. Uh, and cardiac outputs can fall uh, very considerably between those two groups of, of patients. How much lung can we open and for how long? Uh, Gatnoni suggested about 9% of your uh, consolidated lung is recruitable on average. Some more, some less, on average about 9%. In most ARDS patients, recruit recruitability uh, fades after the first day or so. In an old paper of which I was one of the co-authors uh, with Gatnoni and Crotty, uh, if you look at the uh, peak levels that, you, you're, that are necessary to maintain an open lung, most lung units are kept open by pressures less than 15 centimeters of water. And uh, those that are, are uh, need uh, higher peeps to keep them open are, are generally the most fragile and, uh, and most uh, prone to, to, to damage. Increased global lung stress, I'll go quickly through this. Uh, we know that as we increase the, uh, the airspace pressures, there are certain uh, focal points which uh, exceed the stress levels that are uh, associated with a fully open lung. These are stress amplified areas. And if we take a, a given driving pressure and increase the level of end expiratory pressure or mean airway pressure, you, s you cross a threshold above which you become, uh, you're, you're exposing the patient to dangerous pressures above the threshold and fewer lung units may be 
uh, susceptible because fewer are at those junctional interfaces, but those that remain are at high levels of, uh, of stress. This is a paper we just published uh, about what happens when you elevate positive end expiratory pressure uh, and uh, from going from a low level to a higher level of positive end expiratory pressure, vascular congestion, inflammation, alveolar collapse and edema, everything seems to get worse as we elevate positive end expiratory pressure without su uh, significant recruitment. We need to use moderation in all things. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's been said that airway pressure release is really a very good thing if you can keep the driving pressure of the machine within limits. But that's sometimes very hard to predict. Small driving pressures in certain patients and under certain circumstances can tr turn into very deep excursions of. Uh, of uh, uh, airway pressure. These are actual driving pressures associated with the machine cycles. Uh, this, this was already mentioned uh, by Dr. Linden. Uh, this uh, study uh, was just published for in adults uh, from China and was really dramatic uh, early application. And I emphasize early application was the thing that they felt was, was beneficial. The data looked rather impressive, uh, both in terms of uh, what a actually happened in the trend of plateau pressures with APRV falling and with the mean airway pressure uh, being considerably higher, uh, stable, and falling a bit over time. Now, these are seven days we're talking about here, but they initiated uh, APRV early. The editorial that was written in response to that uh, basically said, in, at present, we cannot claim that early application of airway pressure release ventilation ARDS is a therapy for all. And they uh, outlined very nicely uh, why they thought that was important. In pediatrics, this was a very disturbing uh, paper, airway pressure release ventilation. Uh, it turned out that um, APRV as a primary ventilation strategy in children was associated with a trend toward higher mortality compared with conventional low tidal volume. Limitations should be considered while interpreting these results. And in the uh, editorial associated with this in the Blue Journal, uh, the theoretical benefits of APRV have so far not been demonstrated in clinical trials. And basically, they're saying it's possible that a subset of children would benefit, but the available evidence doesn't support it. In fact, suggests just the opposite. So the APRV clinical trials data, as Dr. Litton suggested, is uh, not very good. Uh, you've got to be careful in how you interpret it. Uh, the concerns, and this is my final uh, slide here, high mean airway pressure, hemodynamic compromise in non-recruiters, potential for core pulmonality, disadvantaged respiratory muscles at high levels of pressure that you don't need, uh, the chest wall doesn't operate as efficiently, Increased lung stresses, higher PEEP ups the ante on unrecurrent tissues, driving pressure swings can be worrisome. It's difficult to ma master its safe use. Uh, the pressures and the timings requires careful monitoring of what you're actually applying and how low you're letting end expiratory pressure go. Sedation fluctuation may lead to hemodynamic co uh, compromise. It's not the best option for lung protection. Uh, it imposes discomfort in many patients and tr have troubling results in the tr clinical trials. It's a viable option only when recruitment benefit exceeds over distension hazard. So, uh, as Gary Larson, a uh, uh, very good uh, uh, cartoonist, said, if you're going into the jungle, this is the right apparel to have. If uh, you're going into the jungle and you're, you're dressed like this, you better be prepared for trouble. Uh, it's okay, APRV, <coughs> if it started earlier, the patients are fluid excess, stiff chest wall, fewer cold morbidities, easily <coughs> recruitable. It's not okay if it started later, when the recruitment potential is less, or is in rescue mode, fluids are in balance, normal chest wall, predisposing cold morbidities, and not highly recruitable. Um, so, in summary, nothing dies <coughs> harder than a bad idea. Uh, APRV is getting a little bit long in the tooth, 
And I would have to say that APRV, unfortunately, seems to be spreading uh, <laughs> and, and uh, as a concept uh, more than 30 years after it was, uh, it was first presented. And in that context, I would say after three plus decades, why have we not yet learned in ARDS it's the singer, not the song. <coughs> it's the clinician, not the mode. You have to understand it, and it's not all that easy to master it or to apply it to the right patients. So thank you very much. <laughs>